Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Peter Glick. Uh, welcome to this UN event, Water, War, and Peace. Uh, we have both a live event and a Zoom event. So for I have two different audiences here. I just want to lay out a few ground rules before we actually begin. For the people who are here physically, welcome. Um, I know how remarkably chaotic the whole UN meeting has been. Uh, for you to leave physically the UN and to come to come to this uh, event uh, is greatly appreciated. So welcome. Uh, there are bathrooms down to the just as you exit the door. There's also coffee and tea in the lounge here for you. Um, for those of you online, I'm afraid the coffee and tea is on you. You'll have to find your own. Uh, for those of you online, uh, again, welcome. Um, we will have a series and for those of you in the room as well, we have, have a series of presentations from the four participants who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, about 15 minutes each, and then hopefully we'll have about a half an hour for a Q&A following that. Um, if you're online, submit your questions in the Q&A box. We'll try and moderate them and get to as many of them as time permits. Uh, but all the participants online will be muted, uh, so the questions will be uh, submitted. So with that, uh, let me let me begin. Uh, so first of all, uh, the co-conveners for this session are the Pacific Institute. Uh, that's the institute where I come from. Uh, it's an institute in California. We do research on the critical nature of water problems and solutions. A Circle of Blue, uh, the World Resources Institute, and the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, the four speakers are um, my colleague here to my left, uh, Carl Ganter. Uh, for those of you who don't know Carl, uh, Carl has been for many, many years the uh, co-founder and the heart in many ways of Circle of Blue, which is uh, an organization devoted to journalism around the global issues of water. Carl himself is a journalist and a remarkable photojournalist. Uh, par excellence. He's been committed for many, many years to communicating water issues widely, uh, really from the Great Lakes all the way to Mongolia, and bringing journalism and water together. I would also note he's uh, a newly inducted member of the Explorers Club here in New York, which is sort of a remarkable thing. It's an honor given to those uh, who really remarkably explore the world uh, around us. Uh, to Carl's left, uh, we have Liv, uh, Liz Sakosha. Uh, Liz is at the World Resources Institute. She's a water security associate on the, on the WRI water team. Her work includes contributing to the Water Peace and Security Partnership, uh, an organization of many organizations around the world. The Pacific Institute has also had the honor of part participating with the Water Peace and Security Partnership. And through that partnership, she's co-created machine learning based conflict prediction tools, which she will talk about, uh, that leverages information on environmental, political, economic, social, and demographic conditions worldwide. Uh, the fourth speaker, I guess I'm the fourth speaker, but the third speaker uh, is Liz Patroho. Uh, Liz is a strategic analyst at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, contributing to its climate and security program and to the Energy and Raw Materials Initiative. Arena has, Arena has also been involved in the Water Peace and Security Partnership, uh, in particular through their engagement in Iraq, and she will talk about that work. Uh, the Water Peace and Security Consortium develops innovative tools and services that help identify water-related security risks and allows stakeholders to take action at an early stage with the ultimate objective, I think, which is the objective of everyone here, of not just identifying water risks to security, but figuring out how to reduce those risks. Uh, I guess I'm the, the fourth person. I'm Peter Glick. I'm the co-founder and senior fellow at the Pacific Institute. I'm a climate and water scientist. I've worked quite widely on water issues, water and climate, water and security, uh, water and sustainability broadly, which are all issues the Pacific Institute addresses. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to to be here this morning. So right away, I'm going to turn this over to Carl for his 15 minutes, then I will provide uh, 15 minutes, then Liz, and then Irina. 
Great. Thanks so much, Peter. And hello to, every, to everybody online and water, war, and peace. Um, so I'm going to take you around the world very quickly to some of the tip of the spear. And before conflicts, or who are the people we're talking about at the front lines of these numbers and charts and graphs that we've been looking at all week and uh, today looking at teasing into the future and hopefully being able to change the future um, with better intelligence and foresight. So thank you. Um, Water defines uh, defines history, and it has uh, for you know all of civilization. And this is just this is the Nile in Egypt, um, the heart of you know the heart of our history of agriculture and commerce. Again, another point in the tip of the spear. So when we're thinking about uh, droughts, floods, we're thinking about water. These are the people on the front lines. And you know, I think um, the movie title is pretty apt. Uh, everything is happening everywhere all at once. And I think we we feel that. And that's really what we strive to do at Circle of Blue is try to make that real and uh, and relevant. So quickly, why we do this at Circle of Blue is really trying to take that evidence to action is tell the stories um, that are relevant and so that people can see themselves in the picture and more than empathy, but actually see themselves in the picture and potentially act on the data and the incredible insights that we're all generating here. So just a, also a quick scan, um, Circle of Blue and Globe Scan and World Wildlife Fund last week um, uh, announced a poll and the results, oh, okay, great, we're relevant. Worries about fresh water, shortages are on the rise. So this is what people are feeling. They believe that fresh water shortages are a very serious issue. Um, in the countries that we've tracked together, we started this in 2009 with GlobeScan, the seriousness is really is rising significantly. So people are seeing themselves in the picture, whether they're farmers in, in Punjab or whether they're here or people here in New York or in the Colorado River Basin. And so one in three people now actually sense that they're affected by water shortages and 37% now feel that that's driven by climate change. Adding the other side of that is pollution. 62% say the pollution is actually a very serious issue. This is a big uptick. So not only are people stressed, but they understand that they are stressed and they understand why. Um, we're starting to see correlation between water and climate as well. So we're starting to see these tracked really closely. And in fact, um, you know, climate and water have touched um, over the years since 2003. But this is real to people. I think, you know, as we'll talk about and as we'll hear more, what does water and conflict mean? Um, what kind of stresses uh, does that trigger? Well, let's look at some stresses. So Lake Powell, American West, um, this is what it looked like in May, the day that I flew this, down 178 feet on this day of Lake Powell. I didn't check today to see where it is, but serious risk to everyone downstream, potentially not being able to generate power from turbines because of headwater pressure lack of, and a potential reset of how we think about agriculture. So what will be those stresses between farmers and urban centers? Um, also looking at India, what happens when groundwater goes away and what happens, what kind of stresses, how do families, how do people reset themselves? So this is, we've all seen those working in the water space. We've all seen raw sewage. We've all seen polluted water. This was industrial polluted water. And so going upstream, where was that water actually coming from? Well, the reason that they were pumping water from a canal that was pulling water from this paper mill is because their wells had gone dry. So they went upstream or upstream to a paper mill to use effluent from uh, and containing heavy metals and, and other contaminants to irrigate their rice. So why are we washing beets here with groundwater? Because they're growing the beets with wastewater, with raw sewage. And so they're washing the smell off so they can take them to market, but the farmers are growing their own beets, their own vegetables for themselves and shipping the rest to market. When we talk about also, again, the tip of the spear and conflict and pressure, what happens when there are droughts? Uh, this is in Brazil. These little favela streets in Sao Paulo are named after the villages that people left behind. So to me, that was incredibly touching. And, and just again, um, uh, it's you know, person to person. These are real children. These are living in favelas who've come from their villages because the water is gone. 
Now, what also happens to uh, our water stress and our water risks? We have pressures on our urban centers. This is Jakarta, that arc up there in the kind of center slightly to the right is the famous seawall. If that seawall fails, millions of people will be inundated by uh, by the sea, which you see up, up and over. Down below is basically the effluent from the, uh, the favelas and down below, which they pump the sewage up and over that seawall. Well, then you bring in water. So what's the potential for water conflict? Pumping water from one, uh, one place to another. This is outside of Jakarta, actually a private pipeline. Also, when we look at the world's deltas, right, most productive regions of the planet, this is the delta of Mekong. Uh, this is likely the last rice harvest in this region um, because salt water was, um, was flooding the rice paddies. Well, people are creative, right? What happens when they're under pressure? Entrepreneurship kicks in, right? But literally after I took this picture, he turned the rice paddies into, into uh, brine shrimp and prawns. You turn around and there comes the Mekong rising. So I'm sure that this is gone now, being held back by just plastic and, and wood stakes. So looking around, also some of the key issues that we're seeing, and we know that water and agriculture are absolutely intertwined. Sometimes that doesn't make it into the, into the bigger conversations. But what happens when our soils are washed away? This is uh, far west China, Yunnan province. Uh, this is a farmer who's, they call them dragon's teeth. And these giant rocks are poking up through the soil. Not really, the soil is actually eroding away. So that's why the dragon's teeth are poking up. Well, what happens when that soil and the nutrients wash away? They go in, this is outside of Kunming, and they create algae blooms and affect our water supplies and further stress our cities. Well, also, this is in Michigan. We have a global challenge of phosphorus and nitrate runoff and agricultural runoff. So this is in the thumb of Michigan, my home state. Um, but what happens here? Well, these fields actually drain directly. This is into Lake Huron. It's very similar into Lake Erie. So we have the speedback loop of climate change, warmer waters, and nutrient runoff as we use more water and more fertilizer to grow more food to feed a hungry planet. So these, this is what this is what it looks like when you go underwater with the GoPro. Um, but but in uh, 2014, Toledo uh, shut down for three days their water supply. People had to turn to another source of drinking water because the algae blooms were so intense. Well, also coming back to I you know, love touching on groundwater because of the unseen threat. Well, this is in Punjab. Uh, this farmer was very proud of his flood irrigation, but they have a free electricity, at least he did. And he let his groundwater run, the pumps run 24 seven. There wasn't even a switch on it when he didn't need to flood irrigate, but that water was literally ticking down while we were standing there. Also now, and this is in Hyderabad, of course, the big the threats of water pollution. Um, this river foams and actually comes up and over into his home. So you look at the threats. Well, but also empowered, right? People can talk more, speak, uh, speak to each other, share data. But then we have great assumptions, assumptions of sharing data. This, at least when I visited, maybe it's changed. This was the data center of the Punjab Department of Irrigation. So I was very careful not to wake up the servers asleep in the corner. But when we talk about, again, the tip of the spear, these are the people that I think of every day when we're looking at these numbers and stories and pieces to this giant puzzle. This is a family, a Marasi family in, outside of Rajasthan. And I spent time with them, walked with, their, walked with the family to fetch water in the morning, 112 degrees, searing heat. They do this every morning, the girls do, to get water. So really our goal at Circle of Blue and Pacific Institute, WRI and um, HCSS is to put this into context that we can act with foresight and, and hopefully with vision and so that we can avoid these stress points because what do we really have to do? Again, when I have a, a day of, of stress or thinking about, uh, thinking about water, I think of the people I've met along the way like again, these three girls that let me go with them, their family let me go with them to fetch water. And I think of the resolute nature, human nature that they represent and the opportunity for all of us to really soften this, this soften these blows and turn that conflict into really into heart and soul collaboration. So with that, let me hand off to, to Liz, to Peter. So I will hand off to Peter. That's right, Peter, you're next. 
Well, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, so I think you could see when I said that Carl is a photojournalist par excellence uh, and an explorer. He's been around the world addressing these global water issues, looking at the communities on the ground. That last photograph, I have a copy of it on my office wall. Um, his ability to both tell the stories and to show the people involved is, is quite remarkable. So thank you for, for setting that up. Um, so I'm going to now uh, give a sort of an overview of the issue that we're discussing today, this issue of water, war, and peace. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of strategies, the history of conflict over water, and ultimately, hopefully, strategies for reducing those, those risks. Now, let me start with a summary so that you know where I'm going. Uh, there's a long history of violence associated with water resources. Uh, going back more than 4,000 years and continuing literally to the current day. Uh, the types of conflicts that we think about at the Pacific Institute, the way we organize our thinking around this is water as a trigger of conflict. That is the issue of disputes over control or access to water where water itself triggers violence. Uh, water as a weapon of conflicts, that conflicts that may start for other reasons, but where water or water systems are used as weapons uh, of war. And water is a casualty of conflict, where water or water systems, again, are the victims or targets of conflicts. Again, conflicts that may start for other reasons, but where water systems are attacked. And I'll talk about specific examples. But those are the categories. And typically, when there's a conversation about water and conflict, Mostly it's about the first one. Water is a trigger. Water is scarce. People are fighting over water. But all three of these categories turn out to be extremely important. The causes of conflict including include a lot of different things. We're not talking really here about water wars, but about water as a consequence, water and water systems as consequences, victims, casualties of conflicts. Conflicts start for religious reasons, ideological reasons, disputes over economics or borders, uh, and hydrologic factors, including now, as Carl has hinted, and others will talk about, climate change. Reducing the risks of water-related conflicts uh, require all sorts of solutions. There are technological solutions, there are economic approaches, there are political approaches and international law plays a role here. And there are improvements in water management. All of those can contribute to reducing the risks of conflicts over water. So there is no one solution to this problem. This is like water itself, a multivariate problem and interdisciplinary problem. Fresh water is very widely shared internationally. Half of the land area of the planet is in what we call an international river basin. Rain falls, it runs off in a river. Those rivers for half of the land area of the planet are shared by two or more countries. And I think many of you, I think all of us would be hard pressed to think of a, a major river that is ultimately not shared by two or more countries. The Mississippi River in the United States is actually shared by Canada and, and the United States. The Colorado River is shared by the US and Mexico. The Nile is shared by 11 countries in Egypt. Uh, the, the Amazon, we think of, okay, it's in Brazil. It's, um, it's shared by many countries in, in South America. So the fact that so much of the water of the planet is shared internationally contributes to the risks of conflicts and the need to think about uh, political solutions to these issues. There's growing competition for water. Populations are rising, economies are expanding, demands for the fixed amount of water on the planet is expanding. There are inequities, uh, major inequities around the world in who has access to and control of water resources that contributes to tensions. And there's growing environmental degradation uh, for, around water resources broadly, including this issue of climate change. Uh, finally, uh, another contributing factor here is that efforts to resolve disputes over shared water resources are often inadequate, and I'll come back to that and other speakers will as well. One of the things we do at the Pacific Institute is we maintain something called the water conflict chronology. For those of you unaware of the conflict chronology, it's the most comprehensive, largest open source database worldwide of violence associated with water resources. Uh, you can see the URL here, worldwater.org. 
Google water conflict chronology, and it will come up. This is a screenshot of the homepage. And there are a lot of aspects to it, but one of them is there's a, an online interactive map. You can sort these data based on time. You can sort the data based on the type of conflict. You can sort the database based on region. Uh, each of these data points uh, can be clicked on individually and it brings up an example. There are now over 1300 entries in the water conflict chronology. I mentioned this at the beginning, it, we separate them by category. Water is a trigger of conflict or a root cause of conflict. Uh, examples today are pastoralists and nomads or pastoralists and farmers in Africa are fighting over access to land and water points. Uh, scarcity and drought in India and Iran over the last several years uh, have contributed to disputes between farmers and urban water users that have led to violence associated with water. So those are a few examples. Water is a weapon of conflict. Uh, diverting water away from villages or opening floodgates on dams in Iraq has been a serious problem in Iraq and Syria. I'll, I'll show a slide about that. Attacks on water infrastructure, unfortunately, uh, in the last few in the last few months in Ukraine, have contributed to the database as well. And water is the casualty of conflict. Again, the Ukraine is an example where water systems have been explicitly attacked. Uh, and our casualties of conflict where water infrastructure has been attacked. We saw this in World War II. We saw this during the Vietnam War. We saw this in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Again, conflicts that start for other reasons, but where water or water systems are casualties of conflicts. This is a graph that shows data from the water conflict chronology just over the last 20 or 21 years, uh, showing first, first of all, the trend in the number of entries in the conflict chronology over time, showing a significant increase in the last few years, and then broken out over those three categories, showing that, again, in the last few years, the numbers of entries have been dominated by water as a trigger of conflict. That's the blue part of those bars. And water as a casualty or victim of conflict, where water or water infrastructure has been attacked. And a smaller number where water has been a weapon of conflict. Again. Uh, and a significant increase in the last few years, which in my mind is a disturbing trend uh, in the conflict discussion. Uh, this just shows a breakdown by region. Uh, uh, every region of the world has examples, uh, but the largest number of conflicts in the last, this is actually for the entire database, uh, have been in Western Asia or the Middle East. These are the UN categories, UN defined categories. A uh, no, significant number in South Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Northern Africa. But again, no region of the world has been uh, immune from the risk of violence associated with water resources. Weapon, a couple of case study examples, uh, both Irina and Liz will talk about these in more detail. Uh, this is a quote from former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who said, too often where we need water, we find guns instead. And that I thought was a very, uh, a, a very well, uh, an important way of dis describing this problem. Uh, we've worked on at the Pacific Institute on water in the Middle East quite extensively. We published a paper fairly recently summarizing this issue in Iraq and Syria during the recent serious conflicts there with the Islamic State. This is simply a map of the Tigris and the Euphrates River, where historically there have been. Uh, conflicts over water, including, I would note, the very first entry in the water conflict chronology in 2400 BC is in exactly this region. But during the Islamic State violence, the, the, the civil war in, in Syria uh, and the violence in Iraq, every one of the major pieces of water infrastructure sort of circled here. You can't really see it very well, but the, all the dams on the Tigris, all the dams on the Euphrates were uh, either attacked, were taken over by different parties at different times during the conflict, water was withheld from communities from these, from this infrastructure, or used to flood communities during, during this violence. Uh, there are lots of examples. Um, in the Ukraine in recent years, uh, in recent years, in recent months, literally just a few months ago, at the um, Kakovka Dam, uh, the dam itself was attacked. Uh, some of the floodgates were destroyed by the Russians, releasing water from the reservoir behind the dam, 
Uh, this is the picture on the top here shows literally the explosion in November uh, to prevent the Ukrainians from crossing over the dam. Uh, and then you could see in the bottom picture, the release of water from those damaged floodgates from some of the satellite images of the dam. And then uh, this is a satellite image showing the dam and the reservoir right before that dam was attacked. Uh, it's a little hard to show. Is there a, uh, Yeah, it doesn't really show. This is the dam right here on the left side of the screen. Um, and it shows the dam intact and the reservoir behind the dam. And then uh, this is uh, a, a satellite photo just from about a month ago showing, first of all, the release of water from the dam circled in the, in the red circle. You can see the water being released from the dam and the decrease in water level uh, let me, maybe I can go back. If you look at the upper right, that's the water level when the water level was fairly high in the reservoir. And then uh, the water level has been drawn down very dramatically. Uh, water has been released. Uh, the Ukrainians are trying to release water upstream to refill the dam, um, but, but the water is flowing out of the dam at the moment. So quick comments about solutions. Uh, we talked about the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership that all of us here have been participating in uh, a year or two ago or, or longer. Charlie, I have to ask Charlie, how long ago was this? Uh, we released the 2020. Thank you. That was Charlie Iceland. Uh, we, have, uh, we released a report called Ending Conflicts Over Water, in which we talk about solutions to these issues. And in particular, uh, there, there's a lot of detail in those in that report. I urge you to take a look at it if you're interested in this issue, and I won't go into much detail. But we talk about technical solutions. That is, how do we address water scarcity to remove water scarcity from being a, a trigger of conflict, improve efficiency, change access to water sources, improve access to water supply, water waste, uh, reuse, and water treatment and reuse are technical solutions. Uh, we looked at economic solutions. How do we, we improve allocation of water? How do we reduce the inappropriate subsidies for water that waste water or provide positive subsidies uh, to encourage farmers or urban water users to be more efficient in their water use? How do we expand investment in water infrastructure so that everyone has access to safe water and sanitation that reduces tensions over access and control of water resources? There are a whole series of management issues. How do we improve institutions that manage water resources worldwide? A lot of the tensions over water resources are due to bad management. Uh, and so if we can improve water management institutions, as an example, that can reduce tensions over water resources. And then a whole series of political, diplomatic, or legal actions. Uh, how do we better implement international laws of war? How do we better enforce international laws of war. The Geneva Conventions prohibit attacks on civilian water infrastructure. Those laws have not ended attacks on water infrastructure. And as you saw from the, the graph that shows trends over time, those attacks have been increasing. The world community is not good at enforcing existing political legal systems. Uh, one more comment about this. The UN water meeting for the last few days has had a number of sessions that I'm sure many people here have either listened to or attended on transboundary water cooperation. The UN has focused enormous attention on how do we improve transboundary water cooperation. And that's a critical issue. But I would note that there's a gap there uh, and a gap that I'd like to highlight at this session, which is many of the conflicts over water now are not transboundary. They're not nation to nation. They're subnational conflicts. There are conflicts between farmers and urban water users over allocation and control of water. There are conflicts between pastoralists and farmers over access to land and water rights. We absolutely need to improve transboundary international cooperation over rivers that cross borders, but we also need to come up with strategies to reduce those conflicts that are not transboundary, but that are subnational. And I think that's an issue that gets too little attention. So in summary, 
The causes of water conflict include longstanding political, religious, ideological, economic, and hydrologic factors. I haven't talked much about climate change. I'm a climate scientist. The climate is changing. Water is a critical component of that. And so a lot of the attention to reducing the risks of water-related conflict has been ignoring the issue of climate change. That's an added pressure, and we can no longer ignore it. But just as water has been a source of conflict and violence, it can be a source of peace and cooperation and sustainable development. I would note that a lot of the things that I listed on solutions, those are things we want to do for sustainable water management anyway. We want to provide access to 100% of the world's population to safe water and sanitation. We want better water management. We want to integrate climate change into water issues. All of those things, independent of the issue of conflict, are things that we need to do. And the more of those we do, the less likely we are to see conflicts over water increasing. Some major international rivers have agreements. I haven't addressed this very much. But most of the major shared water resources of the world don't have river agreements. The Nile has an old agreement between the Sudan and Egypt, but the other parties aren't members to that agreement. Uh, and so we need to bring all of the parties on these transnational rivers into agreements on every major river of the world. And then finally, the trends are in the wrong direction. You saw the trends increasing, showing increasing violence associated with water and new strategies for cooperation are urgently needed. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much. My name is Lisa Kosha from the um, World Resources Institute, and I will be talking about our work through the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership. Um, so I want to note that I'll be talking about this work, but it's very much the work of Deltares and HCSS as well. So I want to start off the presentation you're with... You're in the back. Just oh, speak up. That's just wrong. That's wrong. Line. Oh, sorry. Okay. Apologies. All right. So I want to start off my presentation with three thoughts. And one, that water security is national security. Uh, so water stress is increasing, mainly due to increasing demand. And countries are going to need to deal with this inside and outside of their borders. Um, we see that through food shortages, through climate migration. Um, and also, in desperate times, there are a rise of extremist groups. So this is something that is incredibly important in thinking about national security. Second, one of my favorite quotes, if climate change is a shark, then water is its teeth. So like a fish that doesn't really notice a shark until it feels its sharp bite, we are going to experience climate change through water. And we're seeing that through extreme events like in Pakistan this summer. And then last, water can be a pathway to peace and not war. Um, so one of our colleagues, Aaron Wolf, uh, looks at transboundary agreements, and he's found that 80% of those agreements actually leads to positive outcomes. And water is such an important resource that countries can't afford to not talk about it, that even bitter rivals must come together to talk about water and even when there's nothing else to talk about. And that can build trust and understanding and allow them to work together on other issues as well. So the Water, Peace and Security Partnership aims to address water conflicts uh, with four different tasks. One is developing tools and data. We need to understand what is happening um, to be able to address these issues. And I'll talk more about that pillar next. Then raising awareness. So we have quarterly updates where we distill this information in easy to access, simple updates so you can tell what's going on in the world and what we need to be paying attention to. We build capacity. We have online learning modules that talk about what these problems are and what are solutions to solving that. And finally, supporting dialogue in areas that are affected with water resource issues and insecurity um, to start building cooperation around these issues. And we do that in order to turn the vicious cycles of water and conflict into virtuous cycles of water-based peace and cooperation. So my work has really focused on 
the Global Early Warning Tool. And that is a screening tool to look at what areas of the world are having issues with insecurity and instability over water resources issues. We launched in 2019, have been releasing quarterly updates that detail what our model is finding over the past few years, and have just launched an update to this uh, in December of this year. So I'll share our new findings, our new, our new work. So to give a brief overview, we have on our tool a conflict forecast, both in the short term and the long term, and this highlights conflict hotspots around the world. We have regional causal models to get at why, um, what are the, the causes of conflict around the world. And then I'll put that together in an, uh, our global early warning tool demonstration to show you how you can use this in your work for rapid analysis. So first, our long-term conflict risk. This answers the question of what is the risk of deadly armed conflict over the next year? So we ask, do we predict at least 10 fatalities over the next year? And that's how we classify conflict based on input from stakeholders. Was there also 10 fatalities over the past year? And then we put that into different categories of ongoing conflict in yellow, emerging conflict in orange, and under that conflict threshold in dark blue. And this is useful for identifying emerging conflict hotspots long-term strategic planning, and prioritization of areas that we cover. So next, our short-term estimate. And this answers the question of how intense will conflict be over the next two months? Uh, how many conflict events do we predict in the coming months? And how has that changed from the previous two months? So this is useful for on the ground agile response, planning upcoming events or travel, benchmarking future conflict in different places compared to what's happening now. So what areas are getting worse? What do we really need to worry about right now? Great, so for the long-term conflict model, we used a random forest approach that's more into categorization. Is there conflict or is there not conflict? With this, we wanted to be much more accurate in terms of how many conflict events will happen over the next two months. So we use a long, short memory model, LSTM, which is great at looking at time series and understanding how the previous time period affects the current time period. And we're only predicting battles and violence against civilians as part of the armed conflict location and event data set from ACLED, which is a fantastic data set on, on current conflict around the world. So, sorry, the graph is a bit squished, but I'll try to explain what you're seeing here. In dark uh, black and the solid color, that is the actual number of conflict events in one area in the world, in Mopti Mali. And that dashed line is a naive approach. So this is answering the question, how well are we doing at predicting conflict? And a naive approach is just saying, if there was conflict last month, there will also be conflict in this place this month. Well, what we did with our LSTM model, so I'm not sure if you can see too well, but uh, our model is really matching the peaks and the troughs of that curve much better than the naive approach. So we're 44% better and we've been able to predict conflict events within two events of what's actually occurred. All right, so next, the regional causal models. So this will answer the question of what is the relationship between water and conflict and how strong is that relationship? So we we'll take a cross section of data and time. These are static causal models for now and run thousands of iterations of statistical experiments to understand this relationship. And then we'll visualize the model through causal graphs. So no worries, I will walk you through these. They're a little bit more complicated. Um, and this is useful for understanding how complex water-based conflict is um, and identifying what variables are statistically significant in predicting conflict. So I'll show you what that looks like on the website. So this is waterpeaceandsecurity.org and then causal models. We'll show you a causal model 101 area. So we have on top indirect, indirect relationships. Um, and these are the main causal reasons for conflict. 
and then mediating factors. So this shows that A affects B and through B, there's conflict. So these are the factors that mediate how A or the indirect effects of conflict mediate the outcome. And then C is the outcome. We have a section on the methodology and you're able to se select a causal model by regions. And these are the seven World Bank regions. Okay, so we'll go ahead and select Sub-Saharan Africa. And we'll see that the indirect causal relationships are variation in precipitation and the gap in crop yield. There's mediating effects like the density of livestock. Um, and then of course the conflict outcome of conflict events. On these pages, we show what data we use to calculate this and have links to that data and information. And then again, a causal model 101 to understand what these are saying, because they are a bit more complicated to understand using advanced statistical techniques. Um, so talking about the assumptions that we used and the effects. Great, so let's put it all together and I will show you how you can use our global early warning tool. So say I am an analyst at a government agency worried about water and insecurity in Iraq. So I'd use traditional methods to understand what's going on. So read latest reports from Relief Web or, or news media outlets, or maybe Carl too. And then I'll go ahead and look at the causal model for that region in the world. And I'll see that things like density of greenness and population, right, are, are indirect causes. Um, and then the mediating factors are also quite agricultural and informative. So what I will take away from that, that crop conditions and agriculture are specifically important in this region of the world. So I'll go back and for my background research, I've learned that Iraq is dependent on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, that drought and low flow conditions allow salty water to flow upstream. And, and you all talked a bit about what that does to crops um, and that there's challenges with water pollution that I've read from some articles. From my causal graph, uh, I've learned that vegetation health has a causal link to conflict. So I'll go to our global early warning tool and go ahead and zoom in on Iraq. I can see that mostly there is ongoing conflict in yellow and a few areas of emerging conflict in orange. So from my short-term conflict intensity, I can see that there's a variety of different conflict events uh, planned and, and mainly centering around Baghdad. Looking at the change in direction, we can see that there's some areas slightly decreasing, some areas slightly increasing, kind of in those darker colors, um, and one area increasing quite substantially. So from that, I also wanna see what's been happening in the past. So I'll turn on Peter and Pacific Institute's water conflict chronology and see that, you know, in most of the, the areas, water is a casualty of conflict just due to so much violence in that region. But there's also a few areas where water is a trigger of conflict. And that's what I'm particularly interested in because that's where I want to apply intervention methods. So here in Bastra, I can see that there were violent conflicts in 2018 over water pollution. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm definitely wanting to think about and, and maybe thinking about interventions and water quality issues. From our causal model, we learned that crop health is very important in water-based conflict. So I'm gonna look at my um, crop vegetation health data set and see that the brown color really represents uh, less, uh, worse vegetation than normal. And I have a time series there too that looks at the peaks of vegetation and the troughs and seeing that it's a little bit lower. The greenness is a little bit lower than, than normal. So will it get better? I'll turn on my standardized precipitation forecast. So this is how dry or how wet it will be over the next three months. And that red is not a good story. It's going to continue to be dry. So I've learned that, you know, crops and, and food conditions are important. So I'll turn on a, a real-time forecast. Well, quite a few actually are real-time, but this one as well, of food price, price spikes around the world from the World Food Program. And see that though it's not as bad as Syria, that dark red of many food systems in crisis, Iraq is still not doing great. There are a lot of food areas that are stressed or alert. So I wanna think a little bit more about the storage aspect. So I'll put a plug in here for a new tool we just launched on Tuesday here at the UN Water Conference, Global Water Watch. And this looks at reservoir surface area and soon volume and reservoirs about 70,000 reservoirs around the world. 
So remotely, you can kind of get a pulse of the entire world on how is water storage doing. And here we can see that the warmer colors, the reds and oranges, show lower reservoir storage levels than normal, and the blues higher. So there's a few darker reds that look like they correspond with pretty big reservoirs. So something that we want to look into. So um, the next thing I'll do is these reservoirs are probably important for food, but also energy. So let me turn on a global power plant database. And that blue color you can see there are um, hydropower plants. So what I want to find out is if any of these reservoirs are also hydropower, because then we don't only have a food security issue, we potentially also have an energy security issue we need to address. And here we can see in Hadita, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, we have a lower than average reservoir and it's the second biggest hydropower plant in the country. So that is something that we need to start thinking about. I also learned from my desk research that water quality issues are a challenge in Iraq and turning on the WRI's aqueduct data, I saw that untreated connected wastewater is a huge problem in this area. It's a really high risk here and that there is a medium to high risk of nutrient pollution as well. So those are two areas that are potential areas for water-based intervention and um, yeah. All right, so as my findings from this, I knew that we were dependent on the Tigris and Euphrates River, but I've learned through this tool that there is low reservoir storage in this area as well. So low flows and low reservoir storage. Um, dry conditions are expected to continue in, um, which will make the drought and low flow conditions even worse. Uh, food price spikes and hydropower reservoirs are low. So this is something I didn't quite hear from the media or the background research, but I saw that through the tool um, and that there are challenges with water pollution, like high nutrients and low wastewater treatment. So that is the very first step. That is a very rapid analysis of the situation. And the next step with the Water Peace and Security Partnership is to do local analysis, engagement, and participatory action. So we have programs in a few countries around the world, like Iraq, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Mali. And I will hand it over to Irina now to talk more in depth about our work in Iraq. So thank you. Um, all right, thank you, Liz. Uh, I will try to speak louder <laughs> for uh, also people here. Uh, oh. you're you're skipping through my oh, I'm presentation sorry. <laughs> sorry, uh, there yeah <laughs> okay thank you so much um so well my name is Irina Patrojo and I will uh, take over from Liz uh, together with uh, our uh, we're a consortium of six uh, institutions within the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership so HCSS uh, the World Resources Institute but also IH at Delft, Deltares, uh, International Alert and Wetlands International. Um, and well, Iraq is one of the countries uh, where we are active. Uh, and I would like to discuss today uh, the nexus really between water insecurity and conflict and ways in which water can be turned into a source of cooperation and not just a trigger or a, a risk for conflict. Um, and I wanted to start with this uh, quote from uh, President Rashid that it was part of the uh, UN Water Conference just a few days ago. Um, and I, I will quote it, Iraq is emerging from the ashes of war facing an unprecedented water crisis that is worsened by the compounded effects of climate change and neighboring countries' water policies. Uh, and I thought this was such a powerful quote because it really highlights the urgency of action, both for the international community and for Iraqi stakeholders. Uh, and it also shows a, a glimpse into the complex challenges that Iraq, uh, the Iraq's, Iraqi water sector is facing. Um, so what is really happening in the water sector in Iraq? Uh, we understand uh, water security or water insecurity in terms of water quality and water quantity. And unfortunately, over the last years, both water quantity and water quality have been decreasing in Iraq. Um, so, uh, as it was mentioned a couple of times already, the Tigris and the Euphrates provide up to 98% of Iraq's water supply. And over the last years, over the last decades, it has already, the supply has already gone down by uh, 80%. And this is only expected to get worse due to climate change and other challenges. At the same time, water pollution and salinization are impacting um, 
well, a range of different factors, but also the supply of fresh water, as well as uh, it, it uh, negatively impacts the amount of arable land, impacting food security, etc. And uh, there are, uh, as I mentioned, a, a very various different causes, both natural and man-made causes that are impacting this um, water insecurity. Um, so there is, of course, climate change, uh, and that is becoming more and more prominent, and people are you know, dealing with its consequences every single day. Uh, there is also outdated and damaged infrastructure uh, caused by, you know, years of uh, war and instability. Um, there is inefficient water use in certain sectors, like in the agricultural sector, uh, one of the largest water users in Iraq, where um, a lot of water is not, um, yeah, used as efficiently as possible, causes for causing further problems. Um, there are certain issues with water governance, which I'll get into a bit later. And there is, of course, a transboundary challenge that Peter very uh, clearly uh, highlighted. Uh, as Iraq is a downstream country, uh, the neighboring countries upstream have a direct impact on how much water can actually flow to Iraq. And in addition to the issues with decreasing water quantity and quality, of course, there is an increasing water demand because of uh, population growth, urbanization, economic growth, uh, meaning that uh, the challenges are very complex uh, and very urgent, of course. Uh, in our conceptualization of the water insecurity conflict nexus, we use a couple of uh, well useful uh, terms that I wanted to uh, bring up. Um, so we have stressors. Those are factors that contribute to water stress, either by reducing the water quantity or water quality. Um, I mentioned a couple of those. So those are sort of the causes of the water uh, insecurity. Then there's adaptive capacity. So those, those are the characteristics of citizens that allow them to ameliorate the water impact, the impact of water stress on their livelihoods, um, whether that is financial capital, whether that is uh, you know, personal network, whether it's tribal affiliation, whether it's gender, age, et cetera. Then we have uh, coping mechanisms. So uh, faced with water stress, people can choose to react in several different ways. And um, in uh, you know, combination with pre-existing grievances and ca uh, catalysts. So those could be existing uh, socioeconomic tensions, tribal politics, etc. Uh, this can lead to conflict. Uh, so if you put them all sort of in this framework, which it looks linear, but it is not. It is a cyc cyclical, um, yeah, relationship. Um, you start. You start with stressors. They are impacted by actors, but also impacted by climate change. Uh, that uh, have an impact on the water situation understood as quantity and quality. Uh, then depending on the adaptive capacity of the different uh, groups, uh, as I mentioned, financial capital, age, income level, et cetera, um, the water stress has a worse or a less worse effect uh, on human well-being and livelihoods. Um, so depending on these people can choose to react and cope with the water stress in different ways, uh, leading to a security situation and conflict. And we don't only understand conflict as violent conflict or war, not at all. It's also a nonviolent conflict, legal disputes, um, instability, etc. Um, and within uh, the Water, Peace and Security Partnership, we uh, look specifically at the internal water issues of Iraq uh, because we're, we're trying to look for ways to increase resilience and really, um, you know, if water stress becomes worse, what, what can you do internally to uh, mitigate the consequences and make sure that they're not as bad as they could be? And we have identified, uh, yeah, a couple of different challenges. Uh, on in the relation with water governance. Um, so on the one hand, well, let me just start by saying, of course, water, um, water policies, water security policies are so complex and so interrelated among across sectors and across uh, governmental agencies um, because there are long-term structural issues. Often uh, plans are very ambitious and require a lot of time and a lot of budgets, uh, meaning that, um, uh, that is not always possible. So often there are quick solutions, short-term solutions that are not perhaps always uh, leading to the best long-term outcome, uh, reactive rather than proactive policy. So uh, reacting to an issue rather than trying to act uh, before to mitigate some of the consequences. Um, and related to that is, um, yeah, it's 
the dysfunctional or difficult coordination and integration of responsibilities horizontally and vertically. So uh, horizontally uh, among different authorities on the same level. So uh, of course, I've, and I've heard this uh, a few times already during the UN Water Conference, and it's uh, water is not just about water, water is about food security, it's about energy security, it's about sanitation, it's about health. So it's very difficult. It requires a whole of government approach, which is difficult to, uh, to always achieve. And of course, uh, between the different levels of government, uh, the federal and the governorate levels, um, you know, in charge, the federal level being more in charge of approving plans and the governorate level of implementing plans. Perhaps they don't always have the, the resources, the funding, the, yeah, the resources to implement all of these uh, plans. Uh, and water governance, as well as other types of stressors, can lead to um, well, many types of conflicts, but we have, we I look at specifically three. Uh, the first one being conflict between authorities. Um, so again, conflict is not violent conflict, but non-violent disputes in the forms of legal complaints, political accusations uh, between, uh, yeah, vertically, but also horizontally between authorities uh, over the fair allocation and use of water resources. Uh, and I have here on the slides an example from 2018 in Basra, but really this, this kind of things happen, and not just in Iraq, they happen in all countries, of course. Um, then there is conflict between authorities and citizens, uh, and this is also a very good example of how water is a, a trigger uh, and can be a, a conflict multiplier, but not always the root cause. Because um, if there is a, yeah, for example, just last week in the Ticard, there were uh, clashes uh, triggered by water scarcity between the police and citizens, as well as the, yeah, the Basra water crisis in 2018 is quite a well-known example of how, uh, you know, uh, water issues led to protests and eventually violent, violent clashes. Uh, but th this kind of conflicts aren't, are rarely exclusively about water-related demands. They start like that because of uh, water pressure, but they continue uh, because of, you know, uh, deeper grievances related to unemployment or corruption or other types of structural structural issues. And if this kind of thing happens in one province, of course, it can also spill over to other uh, other provinces and then cause a bigger, bigger issue that is also more difficult to um, yeah, tackle. And uh, finally, uh, if you go, so if you go for, from the authorities to authorities and citizens, and then at the really local level, there are conflicts between uh, just different socioeconomic groups, uh, farmers, herders, um, and they really uh, deal with a lot of water insecurity. They, they you know, experience it every day. Uh, there's literally just, you know, different families, different uh, households uh, at different parts of the rivers, and one, they're all struggling with water insecurity. One of them gets more water for themselves and the other family you know, doesn't have it anymore. And therefore they, uh, in relation to perhaps they're from uh, different tribes or different networks or they already have some kind of latent conflict. Um, this uh, water insecurity can be a catalyst or you know, it can really push this into, into uh, conflict, violent conflict. And another very, um, yeah, relevant, important uh, sort of group in Iraq or, or network is um, yeah, our tribes. And it's very interesting because they are both drivers and mitigators of conflict. Um, and they're hugely relevant in Iraq because 75% um, of the population today belongs to one of the 150 tribes. Of course, it depends on different uh, areas and different regions, how strong or how prevalent, prominent the, the tribe is. But uh, of course, there's so social safety nets for a lot of people. Nets for a lot of people, and uh, people uh, go through this kind of traditional uh, conflict resolution mechanisms, which can be a good thing because uh, they can uh, prevent conflict, so they can solve the issue uh, in you know a different way. But it can also, uh, depending on the relation between the the community leaders, the tribal leaders, they can also lead to more conflict and more violence because of pre-existing tensions. Um, and this just once again uh, highlights the need for inclusive and conflict sensitive approaches when you deal with water situations, not just through formal levels, but also through informal kind of traditional uh, mechanisms. And this is sort of a version of what Liz uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so the Water Peace and Security Partnership in general aims to turn vicious cycles of water 
and conflict into virtuous cycles of peace and cooperation. So if a water related challenge in co cooperation or in combination with unsustainable water management would lead to competition and even conflict, we would like to, uh, through uh, effective water management, uh, have it lead to cooper through cooperation and exchange to uh, sustainability and more development. Um, in Iraq, we, um, yeah, we focus on four uh, provinces in the south, and that those are highlighted on the map. Uh, Wasit, uh, Misan, Dikar, and Basra. And um, yeah, we engage with, uh, we try to engage with government authorities, with NGOs, international organizations, and local stakeholders, and really build on existing initiatives, really build on what is already taking place, the actors that are already uh, sort of there for a long time and uh, have legitimacy to act and try to, um, yeah, pull efforts, facilitate action through uh, the innovative tools and uh, the early action, early warning action, um, yeah. Uh, models uh, and we have a yeah we have a level b engagement uh in our right in our um cooperation which means we cannot we are not active in iraq but that means that we can really build on existing uh initiatives and on actors that are already active there and try to facilitate and support in any way that we can through the uh, instruments and the tools that we provide and we have uh five uh, integrated action areas. Uh, the first one is understand, so that we do that through stakeholder and conflict analyses, uh, human response and hydrological models. Um, we then move towards mobilizing, so really trying to create this political awareness and urgency, which is clearly already uh, a major, um, it's already very noticeable that that exists already and it's really, uh, yeah, taking off. We have learned, so trying to enable different actors, whether global or local, to take informed and conflict sensitive actions and dialogue, so support existing uh, existing uh, mechanisms in the prevention and mitigation of water related uh, conflict. Um, and the final um, <laughs> slide, I see already I'm a bit, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just a few takeaways. Um, yeah, in Iraq, tangled formal and informal power structures and uh, sometimes suboptimal interagency cooperation pose uh, huge challenges to the water sector. And that brings the need for an informed, inclusive and integrated approach that addresses different elements of the water conflict nexus um, and try to build as much resilience as possible. Uh, and in response, uh, our partnership, the WPS partnership, uh, supports the development of a shared understanding of the water conflict risks among the different actors and try to support existing initiatives and dialogue. Um, yeah, to try to mitigate some of the water stress um, in Iraq. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much, Irina. Thank you, Liz. I'm just gonna say one quick word and then I'm gonna turn this over to Carl. Uh, Water is a huge issue. We all know that. Um, it's connected to everything we care about, to the human health, to ecosystem health, to water, to war and peace and security, uh, to economics, to politics. And the issue of water and conflict is equally complicated. Uh, the, the critical objective here in a short session like this is to at least talk a little bit about efforts to try and understand all of those connections to try and understand the factors that contribute to water-related conflict and violence and the tools that uh, Liz and Arena described, the water database that I've described are an effort to understand the history, the factors that get involved in contributing to those examples of violence, but also with the ultimate purpose of identifying strategies for reducing those conflict risks. The role of population, the role of food food security, the role of human health, the role of governance, uh, all of the factors that go into these complicated models to try and help us get a sense of where these conflicts may occur, why they occurred in the past, with the ultimate objective of identifying strategies for reducing those risks in the future. That really is what you heard about here. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Carl's go Carl is going to moderate uh, Q and A. Uh, we have some questions online. Again, submit it to the to the Q and A chat if you're online. And Carl, go ahead. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Liz and Arena. Terrific. Um, just we'll make our questions here. We'll start with the audience. And if you can identify yourself very briefly and snappy questions would be ideal. We'll start right here in the front row and then we'll we'll move around. Sure. Uh, thank you, Nick Kosar from Avangan and Wallens Media. Uh, one, I want to know your uh, response to yesterday's UNU report about water security. And Liz, uh, on the maps, I didn't see any specific attention on aquifers. There were about reservoirs, but in the Mideast region, aquifers are also important. Is there any study about that? And thank you very much. Pass the, pass the mic. So a quick comment about the UN report. Um, I, I think the UN's attention in the last few days at the big UN convention, water convention, for those of you who've been here or those of you online, has been great. Uh, as I said earlier in my comments, the focus really has largely been on transboundary issues, and that's a critically important piece of this. I'd like to see a little more attention on some of the subnational issues uh, as, as well. But the growing attention to this issue at the UN and elsewhere, I, I think, is a a step in the right direction. Absolutely, and thanks for the question. Um, for groundwater levels, when we been creating this tool, there wasn't great data on that in near real time. So it's something that we would hope to add, uh, but not quite ready for that yet. Great, we have some other questions here. Come over here. I'll go back to you guys in a second. Uh, thank you, uh, Ayşegül Kibaroğlu from Turkey, Istanbul. I'm with uh, university, but I used to be working for a track to water diplomacy initiative and also very uh, few years for the government. Uh, first of all, um, I really uh, congratulate this project, uh, Water Security and Peace. Uh, in my classes, we use it, uh, your work on Iraq as uh, in English literature is, is a very quality work, understanding what is happening in Iraq. And I saw the quote from President Rashid. Um, he's uh, he's a, I can say he was a colleague because we were participating in the same meetings in the early 2000s. He's very experienced in water because he was the water minister in the most critical times when ISIS invaded uh, Mosul Dam and so on and so forth. I wish uh, he would use your reports, your analysis, rather than using a slogan like the one that you show, like the rhetoric. So my my it's not a question, but my maybe my humble experience is that I mean you're going great, but it is time to involve Iraqi experts more in your work, and it's time to I think to go to Iraq and work there because it, it still is a quite desk, desktop study. It's a great study, I know. It has to be shared like this, and Iraqi experts and Iraqi bureaucrats in Iraq. Uh, I'm sure you have interactions, but hopefully you can turn it to an institutionalized one. And I also my humble recommendation is that Turkey-Iraq relations against all odds is a very uh, established relations in all terms. In economic terms, it's a very complementary uh, relation. So that's why it's always good. Uh, in water, yeah, it goes up and down, but I also suggest to invest in Turkey-Iraq track. There are good work from Turkish and Iraqi diplomats, and they are uh, thinking of opening a water research center in Baghdad. So that would be great to integrate your work to this field work, really. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Quick response while I get back to the back of the room here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your remark. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. We uh, in already in uh, our tool development and our model development, we try we employ the participatory uh, analysis and development. So uh, the tools have been developed also during uh, workshops and trainings together with Iraqi uh, authorities and stakeholders. Uh, and we're now also trying to move forward to uh, uh, facilitate the implementation in existing, uh, yeah, in existing dialogues and exi existing decision-making uh, setups. Um, unfortunately, our um, official, yeah, uh, rules are level B engagement, so we are not able to uh, travel there, but that also brings opportunities because we can uh, give our tools to actors that are already established and they can try to uh, yeah, make a difference with them. Yeah, the uh, in the, the uh, we are based in the Netherlands and they are based in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah. Let's take back to those other questions back here. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think that this question may relate a bit to the previous conversation. My name is Ryan Cumming. I'm with the Lutheran World Federation. Uh, and as faith-based actors, we're active both in uh, you know, water in reducing water scarcity, but also in uh, supporting refugees and displaced persons uh, in Eastern Europe and, and throughout Africa. So I appreciated, Liz, your description of the, the forecasting tool and the early warning system, particularly the mitigating factors. Uh, I mean, as we know, there's a lot of them, as Peter, you highlighted too. Uh, political, religious, economic, uh, and when it comes to conflict and water and the history of both, we know that truth is usually the first victim in a lot of those. Uh, so when you mentioned a participatory design uh, and local engagement, uh, it uh, it made me really interested in hearing, especially what you had to say, Irina. And so one of the the question the question I have is how are people who are most vulnerable in these situations? How are their perspectives being? Uh, drawn into the research through that participatory model to uh, help us better understand what the real life mitigating factors might be. So how are we combining both grass tops and grassroots uh, perspectives in identifying those factors? Okay, thanks. We'll stack up a couple of questions here, but go ahead and take that. Okay. I will, <laughs> I will react to that. Uh, thank you for your uh, for your question. Uh, that is definitely something that we're working on. Also integrating the global modeling and the local perspectives. Uh, when I mentioned participatory analysis, I didn't mean necessarily the the early warning tool that Liz was talking about, but also our uh, research and our um, um, uh, we have this causal loop diagrams, which are qualitative based on what people are experiencing. Uh, we try to organize uh, trainings and workshops and focus groups with uh, different uh, stakeholders, but it is uh, it remains a challenge to make sure that all of the voices are heard and taken into account. Definitely. Yeah, thank you for the global tool too. We've had an opportunity to travel to some of these areas, um, hopefully more now that the pandemic has calmed down a bit. Um, so we did some research on the ground in Ethiopia, in Djiga, and we're able to talk to people to uh, water managers and also to local tribal groups on what they're seeing as the problem and try to incorporate that best available data into our tools as well. So we haven't done as much as I'd like to, but I'm hoping to in the next couple of years. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think it's a really important question. I, I would note that over the last some time ago, the Pacific Institute has held a number of workshops in uh, uh, Central America, in Central Asia, bringing together participants and shared water resources that would not have had conversations before together to discuss agreements about sharing data, about sharing water resources. Uh, these kinds of agreements won't happen without that kind of participation, and there ought to be much more of it. Okay, I want to jump in uh, for our online audience. Thanks again for tuning in. Um, there's a question, incentives and strategies to encourage agreements between nations where trust is missing. Who would like to take the trust question? Well, obviously, one of the major barriers to sharing water resources is lack of trust uh, among the parties. Where, where there's trust and agreements, uh, there's cooperation. But it doesn't always have to have to be that way. Israel and Jordan have agreements about sharing water resources, formal written agreements, and they have they have an organization that disputes over the Jordan and the Yarmouk River are, are brought to the conversation. Israel is now selling water to Jordan in return. There, there are ways to build trust. And in fact, water can be, a, and several comments have, about this have already been made, water can be a source of cooperation where there is no other cooperation in a region. Uh, but building that trust is, is a key element. Without the trust, it's much more likely you're not going to see these kinds of cooperative agreements. Okay, great. A lot of questions. We'll do short ones. We'll quick question here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ambika Vishwanath. I'm from India and I run a think tank and we work on water conflict and gender. Um, now, South Asia is quite an outlier to a lot of what you have described here right now. And so my question is, um, what is the thinking on, on uh, addressing some of these outliers? Because you can't always predict what's going to happen coming forward and you know countries in south asia conflict comes out of random political statements that don't uh, necessarily 
are connected to water, but they'll be connected to be something else. And then you will see incidences of like everything from stone pelting to much worse. So how do you account for, is there a thinking to account for things like that in this um, tool and the modeling system? Yeah, sure. So something I actually didn't mention during my presentation is that the conflicts that we show, the predictions that we show are actually all conflicts. So we're not just predicting water conflicts like Peter's data set as much because we believe that water can be an impact in many conflicts around the world. And sometimes that's hard to understand or parse out from reports or, or data sets like ACLID. We try to look at the notes column in the ACLID data set and search for terms like water or food or something else. But we realized that wasn't inclusive of all conflicts that water could be an issue. So we are predicting all conflicts. And then we need to look in closer into the, to those conflicts into the uh, contextual data on the tool to understand if water is a factor and, and what, um, what areas for intervention can alleviate the water factor of conflict. Yeah. And, and because if, I, if I can address, I think, another piece of what you asked. These tools will never be perfect at predicting water conflict. We understand that it's so complicated, but the availability of these tools helps us at least identify places that may be at greater risk in the coming months or in the long term. But where we can't predict water conflicts, where they occur, there have to be other strategies for response. And sometimes that's drought response. It's not conflict directly, it's drought response or food, you know, where, where there's where it's famine. 30 or 40,000 people apparently died in Somalia over the last year because of drought. And that's an area where institutions are not great, governance is not great. And so there have to be other kinds of responses as well. And, and that's, I don't have a great answer to that, but, but we need to think about those mechanisms uh, in, in addition. Great. Let's stack up some questions because we don't have a lot of time. We have about 15 minutes or so. So we'll go down the row. Um, let's start down at the end of the row, come back this way. Okay. And uh, and short short questions. Have your notebooks ready up front. Um, so short questions. Sure. Hi, I'm Caroline Black. I'm a colleague of Liz's at WRI. Um, Liz, you wear many hats on the team. One of which is currently to update our future projections data set. Um, that is part of Aqueduct. So I'm wondering how that those findings from that data, it goes out to 2100, will affect kind of the work that Water Peace and Security does moving forward. Hi, my name is Joanna Oltman Smith. I'm a climate activist. I have two quick questions. One is, are your predictions taking into account incentivizing being done on the part of governments for water intensive new quote unquote green energy solutions, things like hydrogen, um, untested, unproven, but sure to take a lot of water in the future. Second question, I understand the focus on fresh water, but I'm curious when I see the words water and conflict, I automatically go to sea level rise. Is there a way to incorporate some basic predictions around that into your modeling? Hi, my name is Oscar Alvarado. I'm at the Hague Academy for Local Governance in the Netherlands. Um, you've touched upon this a lot. Uh, what we see in our work in Iraq is policy coherence as one of the challenges across the same level of government, across ministries, but also between uh, national, uh, regional, and local governments. And in the spirit of collaboration, I would like to invite uh, those of you who are in the Netherlands to a conference we're organizing in May with Iraqi uh, ministerial and local authorities uh, who have concrete action-oriented plans to address these issues. I would love to have someone from this, uh, this partnership there uh, to hear about that and to also offer your suggestions. Great. We'll have some more questions from the audience, but let's uh, queue up. Oh, let's queue up one more here. Just the last one. Hi, I'm Marcela Chacon from Bayer. Very inspirational what you have cho shown us. Uh, there's something missing there still, and it's the private sector, the role of the private sector as part of the solution in droughts, in conflicts, in everything. So I would like to, to know how you are thinking on incorporating it. Okay, that's a pile of questions and we'll come up here. Who wants to take on a few of these? Okay, I can go first. Sorry. Um, great. So I will. I'll try to address uh, Caroline's question and then um, from Bayer too. Um, so with the Aqueduct uh, data, so we are producing better data. We're producing 
uh, more accurate models, more accurate predictions that will all feed into our, our conflict forecast and allow our machine learning algorithms to better predict conflict, to better uh, understand what's going on in the ground. So the better the data, the better our models. Um, and then from there, I'm actually really interested in how the private sector um, will can be involved. And we have through the uh, World Resources Institute, like an aqueduct alliance of, of corporate partners that are that are interested in this. And, and Caroline actually leads that. So I'm curious, I would love for you both to connect and to connect after this to talk more about how you see the role being, because it's something that I think we're really wanting to do, but not quite sure how to do that yet. Um, great. Uh, so thank you for all these, these comments. They're great. I know we're not going to be able to get to everything. One quick comment about the, the private sector issue. Uh, the Pacific Institute, as I'm sure you know, is um, the science secretary for the UN CEO water mandate. And the mandate is, is an area where there has just been tremendous participation by the private sector trying to understand water-related risks at watershed level, at the corporate level, uh, the responsibility and of stewardship of, for corporations. And Bayer, I know, has been an important component of that. And the, the general answer to that, we could have a whole session on it, uh, but the extent to which the private sector can play a role in encouraging sustainable use of water resources in bringing watersheds into balance can help reduce the risks of conflict. It reduces the risks that water will be a trigger of violence. It will reduce the failure to provide safe water and sanitation to communities. Uh, so uh, just a quick comment. I agree completely. There ought to be more conversation about the private sector in the conflict arena, not just the sustainability areas as well. Okay, Mike, Peter has the mic there. Yeah, not too much to add, but um, yeah, definitely agree with the private sector. I mean, there are uh, water users, of course, and they, uh, depending on the industries, they can also be water polluters, but of course, they can also have a huge role in helping uh, the treatment of water and uh, supporting the, um, yeah, the infrastructure building, etc. cetera. And um, well, thank you for the invitation to the Hague Academy. We'll uh, be in touch. Can I have one more? Yeah, yeah, of course. The question about energy um, is a huge issue. Again, we could have a whole separate session on this. Energy is critical for water systems. Water is critical for energy systems. The shift, increasingly rapid, in my opinion, and positive toward renewable and away from fossil fuels, is, of course, a key component of the climate area. And again, the Pacific Institute and I've worked on climate and water and energy for a long time. I do think we have to be careful about understanding better the role of water and energy so that the energy systems we build don't worsen our water problems. And the hydro green hydrogen question, I'm not gonna address except that it raises questions about water and energy that have not been adequately uh, addressed, so. Okay, down here. Patiently waiting, fantastic. Hi, I'm Sanjeev. I work and partner with the different organizations, including the Pacific Institute. My uh, firstly, really valuable and insightful discussion. Thank you very much uh, for that and the work that the WPS uh, partnership is doing. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, the trends are headed in the wrong direction. Um, and of course, the water situation is headed in the wrong direction. So my question is, what have been some of the learnings been from uh, some positive examples of conflict resolution or conflict prevention, whether it is transboundary or you know within a geography uh, amongst the different stakeholders and any learnings from there which can be applied for future similar situations to be prevented. Uh, once we have about five minutes left, Peter will give about a minute to wrap up. So, yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, I'm uh, Majo Jonas uh, from Senegal, I retired uh, from the United Nations, etc. But now helping to establish what we call the Dakar Water Hub, which is more minority at Africa level, the Geneva Water Hub. We started working mostly on transboundary conflicts. But as I mentioned, we feel the need to look more at subnational and local type of conflicts, which is now the, I see the potential for cooperation because when you go local and subnational, you will need to look at it from a depth point of view to have local partners to, to look at all those type of conflicts. But I think 
But the conflict in, in the Sahel region, for example, where you link the transboundary conflict with water conflicts and also all the uh, factors, it will be important to go subnational to look at those type of conflicts. There is potential of cooperation between the Dakar Water Hub and probably the Pacific Institute and other partners working on this subject. Great, thank you for that. Do you want to respond to? Like yeah, so actually a response to both of these. Um, I, I'm delighted that the, the this uh, our guest from Senegal has raised this because the Senegal example is a good example of cooperation and an effort to come to agreement over a, a shared river. And the Dakar Water Hub is a, an example of a success it, a successful organization institution that's trying to address some of these water-related conflicts. Uh, there's also been an effort, I guess, to expand diplomatic resources devoted to reducing the risks of water-related conflicts. Uh, I've encouraged our, the U.S. State Department to get more involved, in, and there hasn't been a great response yet, but I am hoping that, that some of the international diplomatic community can step in in places where water tensions are, 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 are growing. Um, and we've seen a reduction in violence in areas where uh, there are cooperative there are cooperative agreements. And the Israeli Jordanian example is a, is a really good one. Um, those are countries that that signed a peace treaty, but also an, a peace treaty that has an explicit agreement about water, uh, about the shared Yarmouk Jordan River basin, uh, and that continues to be, in my opinion, a, a a partial success story. The Palestinians have not been adequately addressed in that agreement, um, but it's a step in the right direction. And organizations like EcoPeace in, in the Middle East, which are Jordanian, Israeli, and Palestinian groups together, are working on trying to, to address some of the, the water-related issues there. And I don't know if my colleagues here are other examples of successes, but okay. we'll move on. Okay, great. I'm gonna to come to Marsha. Thank you very much, Marsha Brewster. I used to be in the water sector uh, at the UN, and I just wanted to follow up on what you just said, Peter. Um, the, the water agreements treaties that really work on transboundary, like India, Pakistan, and, and Israel, Jordan, I think, and, and you probably remember some of the negotiations we had at the UN, it's often between competent water managers who are hydrologists or engineers, and they know each other. The person in Jordan knows the person in Israel and they trust each other. And that creates trust on the ground. And I think some of those water agreements, if they're based on sort of technical uh, hydrological concepts, that builds the trust. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I would simply add uh, an important piece of that is in need for improvements in data sharing. Uh, we don't adequately collect data on water availability, water supply, or water use, and we don't adequately share those data, especially for rivers that cross borders. Uh, recent advances in remote sensing will improve that, open source remote sensing, but better data sharing is, is, is critical for this. Okay. One, maybe two very quick comments. Sure. Uh, your idea on decentralization and its impact on conflicts in many regions, how does that work? And when Turkey and Iran are actually cutting off a share of the water that goes to Iraq, how do people in Iraq see that as, a, as an element that could create a conflict? Thank you. Well, I can't speak for the people from Iraq, but uh, of course, uh, I mean, if, if you... Um, you literally don't have any water to use anymore. Of course, it's uh, it's a huge challenge, and that's also why building resilience is so important, uh, because that can mitigate some of the some of the stress that uh, comes from the different external uh, impacts that you don't have much control of, as a local. Yeah. Great. Well, we're we're just out of time, almost out of time. But Peter, let me hand it back to you to uh, close this out. Yeah, I'm sorry we're out of time. Uh, we're always out of time. Um, uh, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the audience. I want to apologize to some of the people online who submitted questions. We see them. Um, we'll try and answer some of them moving forward, but but um, we didn't get to everybody's question everywhere. Water is a huge topic. Water and conflict is a huge topic. Um, all I can say is uh, I hope we can continue to make progress in, in these areas. I appreciate all of your participation. Um, and I'm not even going to try to sum up except to say that 
understanding the nature of water conflict is critical in a way that we can move forward to reducing those risks in the future. And it's all tied to the sustainable use of water in the long run. And our objectives of meeting the sustainable development goals, an important part of the UN Water Conference. Uh, and I uh, appreciate all of your contributions. Thank you very much.